So this week's guest is an international recognized strength, speed, and conditioning coach, personal trainer, body worker, motivational speaker, and author who motivates, educates, and inspires people worldwide. He's the founder of Fitness Quest 10 in San Diego, a world-class facility that provides personal training, strength and conditioning, therapeutic massage and bodywork, Pilates, yoga, nutrition, chiropractic and physical therapy programs. Todd works with a high-profile clientele of elite professional athletes. He's a two-time personal trainer of the year for Idea and Ace and has recently received numerous industry accolades. Great List has named Todd as one of the 100 top most influential people in health and fitness for the past four years. His gym, Fitness Quest 10, which is where we're at today, was named one of America's top 10 gyms by men's health and fitness for the past five years. He's the real deal. So today, I welcome Mr. Todd Durkin to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Thanks so much. Great to be here. (laughs) Thanks for having me. This is a very impressive facility. And when we came in, um, and it it tied up to the story you told me, but um, there was people outside throwing bags and (laughs) all kind of stuff outside. So just just, just tell me about the the, the story that you told me when you started in this, this space here, how you kind of had lots of trainers and people working indoors and outdoors. What you see today, we did not have when I started 18 years ago, that's for sure. <laughs> I started with very humble beginnings and uh, I started Fitness Quest 10, no clients, no money, and no business plan. <laughs> not a good way to start a business. And it was very simple, it was 2,000 square feet, it was carpet on the floor, it was refurbished equipment, and uh, put everything on the line to uh, basically share my passion. I knew I wanted to help change people's lives and I didn't know exactly how I was gonna do that, so I was like, let me see if I can open a, a studio. And in year 2000, when I opened a, a, a Fitness Quest 10, <clears> people were like, wait, you're gonna open a training studio, but you're not gonna have memberships? That makes no sense. I'm like, no, I, it actually does. I want people to come in, and I wanna be paid when people come in, not like the typical big box gym that wants memberships and their people not to show up. I want people here. And we created a culture real quick about uh, energy and positivity and mindset. And that's fueled us for the last 18 years. Lots of growth, lots of opportunities, and lots of changed lives. How, how big is this, just to, to put scale So on we it. have uh, where we're at now in the upper studio. I call these the roots, right. because you never forget your roots where you came from. We've got 3,000 square feet upstairs, additional uh, 5,000 sque- square feet downstairs. So right. 8,000 square feet total. We only started with 2,000, and then I kicked out the business next to us, and uh, we had 3,000 square feet for the first six years. Right, right. And you were telling me about how you had without the clients knowing. What was the story about them working outside and doing the change? (laughs) Well, (laughs) you know, when when I first started, one of the the biggest mistakes I made early on was when you're in survival mode, and I remember being in survival mode, you just want to be able to pay the bills. I remember I was like, I just want to be able to put gas in the car to get to work and put food on the table. And um, I was selling training, and it was just me. So I I was always selling me, and I want to train you, I want to train you. Well, I got busy pretty quick, and within three months, I was as busy as, as I could possibly be, training 40, 50 hours a week, uh, five and a half days a week, and um, it was nonstop. Well, it got to the point within two years, I had uh, 18 people on staff, and we were training uh, you know, from 5.30 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night, and it got so busy, we only had 2,000 square feet. And we had to come up with a system because there'd be 30 people in 2,000 square feet. It was, it was unsafe. It was really <laughs> unsafe. So we created this little system where, hey, listen, half of the trainers, you five will be outside for the first half hour. And then we'll just kind of mysteriously change. And the other five will then go outside after that. But don't say change. Just kind of do it. So if it was raining or it was inclement weather at any point, we were in a lot of trouble because we would all be inside and you'd stake out your space in the studio and you just find that space. As a matter of fact, Matthew, where we're sitting right here is uh, to me very sacred area. Um, It's where I started my business and I've trained some of the best athletes in the world with nothing, no equipment, um, just a lot of passion and, and hard work. And I always love coming to the roots because when you have a dream and you have a passion to do something, uh, 
Sometimes we get our own head trash and stink and thinking that you need fancy equipment and you need all this great stuff. Um, really, the, the best trainers and fit pros and coaches in the world uh, are able to tap into a spirit that's inside someone's heart and head, can connect that. When you have tools like great equipment that can only enhance your experience, uh, then it's just gravy. But where we sit right here is sacred ground, and hence that's why we're doing our interview here today. Um, I just always love, uh, love revisiting those days, and I think it's important to remember where you came from and always remember your roots, regardless of how much someone's success someone has how much success they've had or have not yet, uh, it's always important to remember your roots. And that's a good transition then into wh where did Todd start? <laughs> yeah, no, thanks for asking. I think uh, who I am today is very much a part of uh, the person I was growing up like most people. We all have a story. And I always say we all have a, a life we're telling a story about. What's your story? Uh, for me, I was the youngest of eight kids growing up. And I have five sisters. <laughs> we have five. <laughs> Five sisters, two brothers, the youngest of eight, and um, uh, very humble beginnings. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was only five years old, and uh, we didn't have a lot of money. And I realized that the only way out for me was to do good in school and do good in sports. And I always knew I was a little different, like I wanted to be special, like most kids want to be special, but you don't know how to tap into that. And um, I had some good mentors at a young age, and, and um, fortunately, I had a lot of love, and despite mom and dad splitting, despite me having lunch tickets and being embarrassed because we had no money, I look back now, and I'm so proud of that because I realize that's still who I am today. I still have the same fears of being broke and, and being poor and, and not having a lot, and that's part of why I have the work ethic that I have is because I remember being embarrassed as a 8, 9, 10-year-old kid going to the lunch lines, and what are my friends going to think of me? on that. It drove me to, to try to outwork everyone in sports and uh, I played three sports in high school. I was a 11, uh, had 11 varsity letters. I was a four-year starter in, in uh, football and I had the chance to work with my high school football coach Warren Wolf who um, is like a father-like figure and I get emotional talking about him too because this is a man who's had tremendous impact on me. Um, I realized when I was a freshman in high school that I had the possibility that if I continued to do well in high school athletics, I might get a scholarship. Right. I never could have thought of going to college because we didn't have the money to go to college. And um, sure enough, I, I garnered quite a bit of success through my high school football career and uh, was offered several scholarships and um, was able to get a scholarship as a quarterback to uh, the College of William and Mary in Virginia. I, turned down two appointments to the Naval Academy in West Point, Rutgers, a couple other universities because I realized that William Mary had a heck of an education and also had a good football program. Of course, like most young men or women, I had the dream to play pro football. Right. And uh, that was my dream, and I wanted to do that. And I, I remember running, running in icy, icy streets and, 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 and training in the snow. I watched you know, Rocky IV probably a thousand <laughs> times and uh, realized that, I'm going to do this. And Which one of those was a bigger motivator for you at that point in time? It was, a, it was a balance of both. I liked the idea of knowing if I did good in school that I would get the opportunity to play college football at a great institution. Right. So I think the football part was an important part because I knew that that was going to be a vehicle to potentially get me into uh, a great a great school. And that's what it was, was uh, academically I, I – I had great grades, and I, I, it was hard work. It wasn't smarts. It was hard work. And I remember sometimes staying up till 1, 2 in the morning studying. My friends were like, what are you doing? I'm like, I've got to study. I can't just look at a book and it, it absorbs in. i gotta, I got to read it three, four, five times over and over and over again to make sure that I get that. And uh, fortunately, when I got the scholarship to William & Mary and accepted that, uh, that was the impetus to, uh, you know, just the beginning of my career. But it was football and school that both – uh, led to that that time and I'll tell you what you know there were a lot of people that led to that and coach Wolf was one my father came back into my life when I was 10 years old and spent a lot of time a lot of time with me and one thing as a father now of three young children 15 12 and 9 I realized the value of time right. and um, all, uh, it was it was a really really important part what do you of, mean by by that then well because when I went to college uh, when I was 20 years old, after I was there for a few years, uh, my father suffered a massive heart attack, and he died. And um, if, I was to, if I was to ask anyone listening today, who is one person you don't want taken from your life today, 
for me at that point in my career and in my life, it was my father because he came back into my life and he spent a ton of time with me. And uh, he was at every, every game and every practice and he was just, his sacrifice was incredible. And um, he, was the, he, he was a mentor, he was a father, he was a, a best friend. And I realized how much time he spent with me um, was truly everything because at the end of the day, it's not what we have, it's who we have. Right. It's not what we have, it's who we have. And I think about that now, and despite that was 1992 when he passed, um, the impact that, 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 that my father had on me as a man today, as a, as a leader today, as a, as a business owner today, as a trainer today, as a coach today, and, and as a father and a husband today of man, like as busy as work is and as, as much as I want to impact the world, it really comes down to the family, my wife and my three kids and the people I, I work with every day. It's who's in my life, not what's in my life that most counts. That's, that's very easy. And it's easy to, I know, I've, like you, I own business and it's very easy to sort of lose huge. those priorities. It, it's huge. And <laughs> it, it's, it's one of the hardest things I deal with. People often say with all the things that, you know, that you do, what are, what's you know, one of the most difficult? And by far, it's the balance of... Yeah business and family. Yeah. Like I love my family, but I also love doing work what I do and I yeah. found my purpose in life. Um, How do you well, balance those, those two then? Because I guess, you know, in yeah. your career, it's, it's a little bit different because you're also helping people. You're not, I guess, sitting at a desk on a computer, you're, you're changing lives as well. How, how do you sort of um, get that balance? <laughs> well, that's the hardest thing because, I mean, I'm a workaholic in the sense I love to work. I love to work because I love what I do and I love changing lives. And maybe it's one email a day or uh, a text, someone that I changed their life. Like that's all I need to hear. That's music to my ears when I hear that. And it keeps me going. It keeps me writing books. It keeps me training athletes and clients and, and, and doing programs like this, Matthew. Um, how do I do it? I'm very systematic in knowing this. Uh, where, where your attention goes, your energy flows. Um, I am very systematic in how I set up my schedule and, and manage my time. Um, part of managing time is managing your energy. And I have a, a color, color-coded calendar system that I use. I call Mellow Yellow, Blue Sky Time, Green Machine, and Red Tape. And Mellow Yellow and Blue Sky Time are two of the most important times. Blue Sky Time is when you're working on your business. Right. Stepping away from right here where we're at, Fitness Quest 10, <clears> and working on what's my, what's my structure and strategy to help impact millions of people to greatness. That's my purpose. Mellow Yellow Time is Mellow Yellow Time is vacation time. It's time away with the family. It's working on yourself and going into the mountains or going to the beach or getting away so that your mind can relax because your biggest ideas come when you're away from work. Right, yeah. um, so bl Blue Sky and Mellow Yellow Time are important. And then Green Machine Time is when you're actually working. It's when you're making money or doing right. the things that you love to do, whether it be training, working, doing your business, writing a book, <clears throat> doing a podcast, whatever it may be on that. And then Red Tape is organization. And I'm horrible at organization. <laughs> like, if you ask me, I'm horrible at that. Uh, I got a, a bad trait from my mother. Uh, bless her heart. She's still living. She's, she's my biggest fan. And um, she, I, we call them Durkin piles. And I inherit these Durkin piles because any magazine I get, any catalog I get, I don't throw anything away. Because <laughs> I think I'm going to go back and read this, this <laughs> journal article, this magazine post or a thing from 1997 you know, or 2005. And my wife gets on me all the time because like, I inherit these Durkin piles. And I got that trait from my mom. So uh, I'm a big advocate of doing what you do best and hire the rest as well. Right. And that helps me in organization. So one of the things I learned even at Fitness Quest 10 when I had no money, is, is how you can help you bring someone on, hire someone on to help you do what you do because when you can do what you do best and hire the rest, all of a sudden you figure out, wait a second, um, like that person can actually help bring you in business. Because right here where I sit in this 2,000 square feet, I used to get a lot of anxiety I was training straight through from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. and I'd get anxiety because someone would walk in the door, a potential client, and I didn't have a front desk person. Like, it was me. So I couldn't give them a, quote, tour, even though we're like it's not much to tour around. Um, so I'd be like, I'll call you back tonight at 7.30 or 8 o'clock tonight. And it was happening over and over again. Like, how do I grow this business? If I'm always training, I, I'm not working on the business. 
So I hired a front desk person. I now call them directors of first impressions, Dofies, directors <laughs> of first impressions, which play a most important role. And it was Judy Curran, my first receptionist, who I bartered out with, to, to, and she worked part time. And I was like, wait a second, she's here. She's giving a tour. She's giving some collateral. She's doing consultations. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. I can actually go home at seven o'clock at night and have a life and 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 tend to my newborn and my wife and and all that. So that was a great lesson to me, and it's still applicable to today is, you know, the bigger your dream, the more important your team. Right. The bigger your dream, yeah. the more important your team, and the bigger your dreams are, the more important your team is. And, yeah, you know, definitely. for us, we've got 38 great teammates um, now, and I realize as my vision expands and I, I look at all that I'm doing, uh, it's really important that uh, your team is a huge part of that. Yeah. So, so just skip, there's a couple of things I'm going to come back to. The, the color coding system. So it's, it sounds great, and I've, I've tried myself lots of different systems, and one of the biggest challenges I have, and also with working with the team, is, is getting people to have a plan, organize a plan, and then deliver on the plan. How, how do you take that system, the color coding, and then ensure that it's going to work for you over a long period of time? You know, what, what's your, the psychology behind that? Okay. This could get deep now. Okay. If I go too deep, let me know. Stop right. me. Because I said I'm a very systematic person. So I have the color-coded calendar system. That's part of an overall, what I do is called an annual roadmap and strategic plan. Right. So every year, annual roadmap and strategic plan gets done. The color-coded calendar system is part of that. Okay. So if I was to break that down in my annual roadmap, every year I sit down, typically end of the year, beginning of the year, I spend 15 to 20 hours on my purpose. My purpose for life and my purpose for the year. And I go into what's my big five for the year. Like what are the big five things I'm going to accomplish this year? I have a theme for my year and I have 105 questions. This year is 105 questions I have that I go through literally. And I don't only just do it one time. I go back every quarter and I go through that to see how I'm wow. doing with them on track. And then I work in, in quarter systems. I go 90-day goals. So what are my 90-day goals? And then I back in from my 90-day goals into my 30-day goals into my one-week goals into my daily goals. Right. So um, if there's one takeaway that people can get, I reverse engineer my success of where I want to go. Is it always going to work? No way. Not a chance. But I do have a vision of what I want to accomplish and who do I want to connect with and collaborate with so we can uh, accomplish the things that we want to accomplish. But... If you really go into the uh, macro to micro, going into the micro, every week, Sunday night, I do what's called my W lags. My wins from the last week, my losses from the last week, okay. my aha moments from the last week, and then I look at my goals for this upcoming week. Right. So three of the four things I do every Sunday night, I look back. Why? Because when you reflect back on lessons learned and your wins, you realize how often we, we don't reflect back about what we've done. It's always like, what's next? What's next? Yeah, what's on the yeah. to-do list? So I spend about 20, 20, 30 minutes on looking back. My aha moments typically are with family or a conversation I had, uh, you know, something like this about, you know, just having some great conversation with you, Matthew, and, and all the things that you're doing. Um, that could be part of an aha moment, including losses. Like if 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 someone was fired or someone quit or something happened, like how can I learn from that? I always ask myself, what could I have done differently to change the situation? So that helps me moving forward. And when I look at my losses, potentially, some you can control and some you can't, and then I go into my goals. Right. And what are the five things I can do this week to make sure it's a winning week? Right. And then every day, every night, I look at you know the next day. So if you can control the day, and then control the week, control the month, control the quarter, control the year, then your life will succeed. Right. And do you think a, a key part of making that work then is the discipline of sticking to those times? Because I've, I've got a, a system, not exactly the same, but right. the review. And I'm pretty good, but there's bits that I'd like to do better, like the, the, the daily review, etc. But sometimes you get to the end of a day and you, you think, shit, this is the time <laughs> and I've got this to do. Is, is that kind of priority, you know, making sure that you prioritize the time, would you say? Or? It, it is. Time chunking is a really important part. I often work in, in chunks of 20 minutes. Okay. So even if, they write, if I have to write a blog or, or create some form of a, uh, an outline or a proposal, I often think, okay, I have 20 minutes to do this. Right. Now what happens is that 20 minutes will sometimes turn into 40 minutes or 60 minutes, but the 20 minutes to get started with an actual project, 
you're often astonished at how much you can get done in 20 minutes. Like I could write a blog or, or an email or do one of my Doza Durkins in 20 minutes um, when you really have concerted effort. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is just compartmentalizing my business. So I've got to focus on this for this window of time and I've got to then switch gears and go into this. Which hat am I wearing? Am I, am I you know, the trainer hat or coach hat or am I in the, the business growth hat or am I in the dad hat or the husband hat? And all of those take different energies and resources to do. And I think it takes some experience, but um, when you do when you do it long enough, you get decent at it. Yeah. Did did you did you learn that yourself, or did you have a coach that sort of taught you how to do that? Yeah, I, I've had a lot of mentors, and I do a oh. lot of reading. Okay. So I've had. Um, lots of mentors. I've always been a huge advocate of even being part of different coaching groups and mastermind groups. Um, I've been part of different masterminds since 2005. Right. I've had my own mastermind group uh, since 2007 uh, on that. So uh, I'm always part of groups. I now lead groups um, and I've always had mentors. I still have mentors in my life in different areas, some in business, some in spiritual. Um, I'm always learning and I try to read at least two books a month. Do you have a time when you do your reading? Do you schedule that? Yep. Always? So my schedule in the, in the morning is I'll do listening to podcasts. I love listening to podcasts. I'm doing like a, a fasted cardio. So first thing I do before anything happens, before the kids get up or my wife gets up, I, I go down to my home gym and I do some fasted cardio uh, just to try to stay lean. Yeah. And that's where I listen to 30 minutes of podcasts um, on that. And, um, you know, four days a week I'm doing that. That just kind of gets my mind going. If I, can, if I can extract one or two nuggets out of any podcast, to me it's a winner. Right. And it's like, man, that would that, and I'm a better leader that day. I'm a better husband that day. Or I'm just a better human being that day. And then uh, most of my reading, I still like books, like books where you can actually take a pen and make asterisks and notes and all that. I don't like Kindles and stuff like that. I like old school books so you can feel <laughs> the page um, on that. And uh, I'll do that at night. I like okay. reading at night, uh, 20 minutes, you know, before I go to bed. Sometimes I don't last 20 minutes because my eyes, you know, they go to sleep. Uh, Interesting enough, I, my, my latest book, my wow book, I turned into an audio book and that's, that's doing as well as my actually hard, hard bound book uh, because audio, like the podcast right here, people are listening in today uh, potentially, it's audio is, is a really great way to consume content. Yeah. I'm, I'm starting to listen to more books as well. Yeah. yeah, it's a great way. Like when I was driving down here, I was listening and right. you can, if you're at the airport, if you're in a queue, you, you can use that time to put things in. I think it's, it's a good point. Do you, do you think with, when we're taking on information and, and, and trying, to, or, or trying to do things or goals, do you, do you think sometimes people try and do too much? Like you mentioned that one thing from your podcast and five things to a day. And I, recently I've started doing that for the, for the following day. So look, I'm going to just look at doing two things really good and that's success for me. Do you, do you think people make yes. a mistake of... Yes. <laughs> yes. The answer is yes. I think like... Maybe someone just listened to my system like, oh my gosh, there's no way I can do that. Probably not. Like, I, I wouldn't have done that 10 years ago either. I've morphed into that over many years of time. Like sometimes just getting better at one thing, even if it's like nutrition or fitness. Like what do I need to eliminate from my nutrition or what can I add to my physical uh, productivity practice, uh, my routine, whether it be more walking, more cardio, uh, more interval training, hiring a coach. Uh, whatever that may be, I think sometimes just adding one thing in can make a difference in nutrition, in fitness, in business, yeah. uh, not trying to do everything. And, and uh, I heard a quote recently that was pretty powerful. It was, it was like success traps are harder to get out of than failure traps. Right. And what that is all about is success traps, like when things are going good, it's harder to get out of that than if things aren't going good. Because if they're not going good, I need to overhaul everything and yeah. you overhaul everything. But like if your health is good but not great, well, you might just keep doing that because you didn't get a, a diagnosis that you have cancer, you have heart disease, or you have like, oh my gosh, I got a wake up call. I got diagnosed with type two diabetes or type one diabetes. Um, that's an alarm and you try to overhaul everything. But when things are good, that's a trap. Yeah. If you have more in your tank than you think, and, and, you, and you're like, you know what, there's something else in there that's deeper inside of me that's better than what I'm doing now, what's that going to take? And that's where we get into a whole other realm, I get into a lot of my, my pro athletes, is the mindset aspect of what's holding you back from reaching your full potential. What's the head trash? What's the thinking thinking? Where are you, where are you operating in fear? 
where you operating, uh, where you're, you're, you're scared of making those moves because it takes a lot of courage. It takes um, stepping up and, and, and taking action on that. So uh, I know I'm getting kind of deep on that, yeah. but I think it's, it's all real stuff. How do you think you could sort of make that as part of your, your routine or? Yeah, I always say average is the enemy. Average is the enemy and, and uh, we don't want to be mediocre or anything. One of the greatest examples I can give was an athlete that I worked with early in my career. He was actually my first pro athlete I ever worked with. His name was Ladanian Tomlinson. He was a running back for the San Diego Chargers, first round draft pick. And I trained him in the space that we sit um, for nine years, literally nine years. Wow. And he just got uh, elected into the Pro Football Hall of Fame last year. And um, when I started working with him, it was early on in his career, I remember being so nervous working with this guy, like, what am I going to do to help this guy? He's already great. And then when I did my assessment with him, I took off his shoes. He did this one-legged bounce touch test, and, and he was horrible on one side. And all of a sudden, I was like, this light bulb went off when I explained to him how I could help him if he could get balance between his body and we could take him to a whole other level. Well, what happened from 2003 to 2006, in 2006, he eventually became the NFL MVP. He was the best player in the National Football League. And we would often talk about, what's it going to take to stay on top? Right. It's one thing to climb to the top. How do you stay hungry yeah. when you're already doing good or when you are the best? Like another one of my clients, Drew Brees, you know, 18 years in the NFL, a perennial pro bowler, He'll be a first round, uh, you know, elect, uh, elect into the Hall of Fame someday when he's, he's done playing. How do you stay hungry year after year after year uh, on that? I believe it's sitting down and, and really knowing your purpose of like what drives you. Yeah. How do you set new goals that are going to move you, that are going to scare you? Yeah. Like you should feel like you're going to puke one time a month. Right. Like, like literally you should feel like, like from fear, from scared. Because if you're, if you're too comfy, cozy, I would say you're living too fat. Like, yeah. you, you got to have something in your life that's challenging you to get outside your comfort zone because that's where the real riches happen is when you're outside your comfort zone and you're like, man, i gotta, I got to keep moving because the minute you stay where you're at is the minute you're going to lose your ACL, the minute you're going to lose your business because someone's catching up. Yeah. And um, I think with the athletes, you know, those are two of the, the guys I've worked with and two of my, my all-time faves as far as just really working with guys for a long period of time no different in business. No. It's like you got to constantly be innovating. You have to constantly be changing. Um, you have to be looking at the chemistry of your team. Who are the right players on your team? Are they the right trainers or front desk folks or, or whatever? Do they fit the chemistry? And then ultimately, what can I do or what can you do that's going to impact the world? What gets me up every day is how am I going to maximize impact in the universe? Like, what can I do that's going to be a moonshot idea that's going to, like, really make rivets ac across the universe? And that's what gets me up because if I was just coming here every day and just doing my thing, after 18 years of doing that, I wouldn't be as juiced up as far as, like, bam, like, I got to I'd be ready to go. Yeah. And I got to try to change the world. So, to me, that's, that's uh, it's staying hungry. Do you, do you think you can do that yourself? Do you, do you think you need a coach? Because it's, you know, after I've seen myself get to that position and now I've, I've, you know, it happened, I guess, by accident. It, it's taken me into a totally different direction, and I'm so pleased for for, for going through that sort of mentally. It, it wasn't planned, and, and now I'm thinking, okay, I, maybe I should plan that in every year. You know, how how can I sort of put myself into these difficult situations? I, I was listening to a story of, of you when you you did a. Um, the, 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 sh the te television show. Strong. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know whether you want to mention that story, but that, that kind of got me thinking. It was like, well, yeah, actually, sometimes, no matter how top of your game are, when you put mm. yourself out there and, you know, you, you obviously had it in you to do that, but mentally you were like, well, you know. <laughs> there's always a point in your life, I think, there's going to be a time, and maybe it's now someone listening in, where you question yourself. Am I good enough? Am I smart enough? Um, is now the right time? Do I have enough education or do I have too much education? And you start getting this head trash in your, your head about can I do this? Um, to your story, in Strong, I had to overcome this massive challenge that was downright scary. I was the oldest trainer on this show and I had to go through this four-story monolith that was a, a kick-butt physical challenge. And I guess when I was looking at this, one of the trainers saw my look in my face. His name was Chris Ryan, and, and he looked at me and said, don't forget who you are. You're Todd freaking Durkin. And I was like, 
Oh, yeah. That's right. I forgot. Because we all have these t moments where, we, we, where who we hang out with and who we surround ourselves with, we need people like that in our life. And right. Whether they're a coach, they're a comrade, they're a colleague, they're a coworker, they're a spouse. Like we all need people in our life that are going to pull us up, not push us down. Right. So I would ask you know, anyone that's listening today is who's your inner circle? And make sure the five people that are closest to you in your life are the people that you want to be like. You want to think like them, you want to act like them, uh, all of those aspects. Because that's going to really influence the way you think, what you do, how you act. And uh, for me, I'm always looking at my inner circle. How can I enhance who I'm listening and learning from? Uh, because everything that, you, that comes in via books, via TV, via podcasts, it's influencing your brain. There's a chemical reaction that takes place uh, on that stuff. So I'm always looking at that. And I believe it starts with your physical conditioning. Right. You've got to be in the best shape of your life. So you can't be in mediocre shape. <clears throat> what you're, how you're training, what you're eating, who you're hanging out with, what you're reading, what you're listening to, all of that if you're really trying to get to the next level, plays massive a massive role in your overall success. Yeah, and, I, and I've heard a few successful people will say that. It's about the people you spend time with is kind of what you become. Yeah. What, what would you say to someone that's, that's in a place where you don't have those positive people around you? You're, you're kind of, your friends and your family are, are, are sort of holding you down. How, and, and you probably haven't got the money to go and pay for a mentor. Um, how do you go about surrounding yourself with those? Because I, you know, most people would love to have, be in that situation, but it, you know, they're probably thinking, well, how do I, how do I find, how do I make that happen? I think a couple things. Um, if one is in that situation, is number one is in today's day, it's so much easier to connect with people than ever before. Right. YouTube, right. you can find people on YouTube, f free content that can get your mind right. Like you can watch an inspirational, motivational video for three to five minutes, and all of a sudden, I call it the. Zzz, zzz, all of a sudden, you zap in, and you're and you're in the zone because of something that inspired you. Right. See, motivations in the head, and inspirations in the heart, and you want to be motivated every day, and you got to be inspired in the heart, and that's something that takes work. So, by watching videos, by reading great books. I mean, a 20 to $30 investment in someone's life when someone writes a book, if you find someone that you gravitate towards, read their books because you're getting a lifetime of experience in a book or listen to the voice because when you hear someone's voice, there's an emotion that's triggered on that. So find the people that you want, you, know, you like to follow and follow them and read, read their books and listen to their videos. And a lot of that content is free or not a lot of money, yeah. right? If you go to a mentorship or be part of a coaching group, a lot of times there is an investment uh, obviously in that and it's typically uh, a great investment but sometimes it takes a little time to get there as well yeah so so you're saying it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be physically people around you 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 can virtually tap into those people and no doubt yeah. and the other thing if someone was struggling today the thing I'd always say is give back more right give back more don't ask I need more energy or I need more positive in my life. You go out and do that. There's a lot of organizations in every community that are always giving back philanthropically to whether it be kids in need or families in need, adults, uh, you know, our, our soldiers that have PTSD or have been overseas fighting. Like there's all these organizations that find something that resonates in your soul and give back. Right. And watch what happens. It changes it around. Right. right. So I think that's important. And it's like, how, how do you how do you get rid of the hole that that you're uh, that you're in is you stop digging it. <laughs> a lot right. of times we dig our own holes yeah. and we just keep digging versus, OK, stop digging, get out. And it's not always about you. It's about giving back. And watch what happens. The universal law, the law of reciprocity mm -hmm. comes back and all of a sudden your life starts flowing. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen and read and experienced that myself. You know, sometimes when you're focused on yourself and what you've not got, you, 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 as you say, you're digging yourself into a hole. Whereas if you, if you think about something else or someone else and how you can help them, right. it takes the focus off you. And suddenly you realize, actually, you know, <laughs> things are not, too, not as bad as what I thought they are. No doubt. And the thing is, is when, it's usually when someone's in fear or in pain, Right. where their, their world becomes just about that and consumes them. So you're less likely to go out and reach out for help or to give back. And those are the most important times to do that. I remember um, one of the impetuses that got me in the training was I had a career ending uh, back injury, 1995. I was over in Europe, I was in France. I, I took a shot playing football and I, I laid motionless on this football field and I never felt pain like that in my life. 
And I remember for the months and months I was rehabbing, all I could think about was my own pain. And finally, I had to like literally snap my band and say, how am I going to get out of this? Because I'm living in this vortex of negativity and almost depression, practically, of like my dream of playing in the NFL is over. Like the doctor said, three herniated discs, spinal stenosis, degenerative back disease. You're no longer able to play football. you got to find a new dream. And that was like a slap across the face because from the time I was that little five-year-old <clears throat> growing up, that's all I ever dreamt of from five to 25. I want to be a pro football player. Right. And now when that's taken away from you, there's a lot of introspection, a lot of questioning, a lot of self-doubt that, that, that you go through when that's the case. Um, How old was you when, when that happened? Then? I was 25. Oh, 25, right. Yeah, right. I was okay. 25 years old. And, and um, again, looking back now, it's one of the biggest blessings in my life. My father, uh, that experience of losing my father at the age of 20, and then that going, and, and then my, my back injury, 25, were two of the most impactful experiences of my life, and both of them were negative. Right. Isn't it interesting, a lot of times, our, our biggest setbacks are often our, our biggest um, opportunities for growth and learning about life, and not that we ever want negative things or bad things that happen to us. But if you're going through a tough time now, I think it's when you can open your arms and embrace that. For me, a mentor at the time said, stop fighting the pain, embrace the pain, and see what it's gonna teach you. It's funny that after I went through that and started seeking out people in the body work, in rolfing and structural integration and energy work, um, acupuncture, you name it, I tried it. When I was um, going through that process, I was using Vicodin and I couldn't get off of it and I went through this whole process, um, I realized in this five-year window to get out of pain, all that was was setting me up for this. Right. It was setting me up for a career to help people in pain and to optimize performance. I didn't realize that for five years of 1995 to 2000 when I was kind of a lost sheep and lived in 12 cities in less than five years seeking out gurus and people that could help me. I didn't realize that was really an education at the time of what I would eventually be doing. Right. But my sister said, embrace the pain. What do you, what do you mean embrace the pain and how, what, well, what did you actually do? In my world, in football, you're always <clears throat> taught to fight pain and fight through it and overcome it, you know, ego and, and toughness versus going the other way and trying to say, okay, pain. I would literally try to talk about pain and say, what are you trying to teach me? Like, how right. can I work with you? Okay. And uh, for me, I try to just go with a different different aspect, a different side of the brain of instead of trying to like literally fight, fight through the pain all the time is, okay, I'm going to do more flexibility, more breath work, more meditation work. And I started to learn more Eastern principles to, to work with all of the physical therapy, osteopathy work, uh, orthopedic works that I was I was doing from the traditional Western medicine world. I was also in, in part um, taking on some, some more of the Eastern side of things where I could blend the two of them together. And philosophically, I was at the whole time not knowing it, kind of coming up with my own system to help, uh, number one, prevent pain, get out of pain, and two, perform better. Right. And that's what I do now. And the systems that I'm teaching worldwide when I'm presenting on the stage is it's, it's all the different examples and stories I've been through, you can't always predict when you're going through something where it's going to take you. But looking back now, it all makes perfect sense. Right. And at the time, were you, did, when, when the, the, the gentleman told that to you, did, would, did you come to terms with it? Or how long did it take you to come to terms with it? And then did you sort of have a plan and say, okay, well, I'm going to embrace this now for the next few years. I'm going to go and learn and see where it ends up or was it just like yeah <laughs> what was going on well, when i was told when i was told that football was no longer an option it was literally a state of depression because uh although i was living in uh can france not a bad place to be rehabbing right. uh on that stuff i realized i got to find a new dream and although i had already had an undergraduate degree in kinesiology and had some certifications everything else i realized that uh, i got to find a, a, a new way to be able to uh, take my, my work ethic and everything I was going to do into a, a new strategy. And uh, I didn't know really where it was going. It was really about getting out of pain for myself. As I was saying, I was using Vicodin. I couldn't get off the Vicodin for six months. I needed Vicodin. And um, What's that, like a painkiller? Painkiller, right. Yeah, okay. it's a painkiller. And um, I, I had a doctor come into my condo over there, shooting me up with anti-inflammatories. And I mean, it was a pretty, pretty low time of my life. And um, interesting enough, fortuitously or not, when I eventually was able to sit upright where I could fly back to the United States to uh, complete my rehab, I just happened 
to run into an entertainer in Hollywood. And his name was Michael King. And Michael King, at the time, produced Oprah Winfrey, right. Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. And um, I became very close with Michael. He happened to have a bad back, and he happened to be out of shape. And I, he said, do you think you can help me? I said, absolutely. It's the life I'm living right now. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I was able to take this experience and start to help Michael King. And um, Michael said, well, why are you living here at the time I was in New Jersey on the East Coast? And he's like, why are you here in, in New Jersey when you should be out on the West Coast in L.A. where all this stuff you know, starts? I said, well, I don't really, I'm, I'm an East Coast guy. I don't really see myself on the West Coast. He said, I'm going to bring you to the West Coast. I said, no, no, I'm good. I'm going to grad school and this. He said, no, 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 you don't understand. I, got, I know everyone that you need to know to help you take this work that you've been learning. And um, I said, no, I'm good. And then Michael said, well, if you come out and, and I'm going to take great care of you, and if you don't like it, I'll pay for grad school. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved out. Next thing I know, I'm moving in Malibu, and uh, I'm working with all these Hollywood producers, actors, actresses. And I got to tell you, like, I know, like, every athlete on the planet, but I don't know Hollywood world really well. Like, I can walk right by someone and have no clue who they are. Right to my uh, one neighbor was, was Rob Reiner. Had no idea who Rob Reiner was. I had Tom Hanks on. Tom Hanks came trick-or-treating to my house. I had no idea who Tom Hanks was. And um, it was a really interesting world. But what I realized at the time was that that's where I was supposed to be at that point in my life because that's where I learned from one of the greatest mentors I've ever learned in, about fascia. Fascia, uh, Dub Lee, taught me rolfing and body work. Um, he already advanced my massage therapy background, but he, he taught me this. I became his intern, and um, uh, it was an amazing, amazing uh, several months of just working very closely with Dub Lee, who at the time was about 78 years old. He was a guru in the bodywork world, and he was doing he was doing rolfing, he was doing um, orthopedic massage, he was doing energy work and uh, structural integration, and I got a basically a PhD in what fascia was. I had no idea what fascia was and, and I didn't realize that it was, you know, uh, it was enveloped around every tendon, muscle, ligament, bone, nerve, and artery of the body. I didn't realize that you're one big fascial sheath from feet to fingertips, left to right, front and back. I didn't realize that physical and emotional, spiritual, mental pain was stored in fascia. Right. I didn't realize that all these things were, were dealt with a fascial system. I'd never heard of fascia when I was an undergraduate. Uh, studying. So all of a sudden now I was able to really again take my training up to another level and not knowing that someday when I was going to become an entrepreneur and open my own business that it was all going to come um, around and I would be doing body work as much as I was doing training. Wow. What do you put that, because uh, what do you put that moment, because by the sound of things the way you've explained it is the, the meeting with the Michael King put ch sort of change the trajectory of, of where you were going in your life what, what would you put that down to in your or how do you sort of explain that to yourself what do you, is it is it luck is it did you put yourself to be in those positions you know how does someone that's a good question <laughs> i think number one trusting your gut okay trusting your gut and have the courage to to say yes when you're scared when you know your gut says you need to do it right because a lot of these things a lot of the people i met I didn't have money when I went to massage therapy school in Atlanta. I didn't uh, have money when I, and I had no desire to be on the West Coast. I, I, I really enjoyed the East Coast. And I was like, I, I, I didn't know if that's where I was supposed to be, but when I actually prayed about it and took some time to talk to my close uh, family and friends, I said, you know what? This is the next chapter of my life. Right. It's not where I'm probably going to end up, but it's the next chapter of my life. And everything I do and the decisions I make, I often look at them as chapters of a book. Right. So it's not like an end-all, be-all. And I, th I don't want to get paralyzed by the decisions I make, but I always want to try to make the best decisions. Sometimes your head says yes, but your gut says no, or vice versa. Rarely does your gut lead you wrong. Right. So um, a lot of those things, going to play football over in Europe was a gut. It was a gut decision of I was going to constantly work hard. I was going to put myself in a position where I could succeed, and then I was going to take the chance. Opening my own business, if anyone has their own business, it takes a lot of guts. Sometimes your head's saying yes, your gut's saying no, or vice versa. <laughs> sometimes they're both saying yes, or sometimes they're both saying no. Um, but it was very scary to do that. But my gut was saying, even though I had no clue really what the heck I was doing uh, on that, it was pure passion and guts that I want to do this because I know I can help people. And if I can instill the belief in people that they will get better and 
um, through exercise, through nutrition, through mindset, through flexibility, through yoga, through body work, through all the things I can help you. I've been practicing the last umpteen years as both an athlete and now going through the rehab process. I know I can help you get better. 90% of success is between the ears, and if you believe that I can help you get better, I have the actual st strategy to help you, but once you start believing it, then we can really get to some good, good right. levels. Right. So um, that's all I think part of the journey, and I think having the gut, uh, the guts and the courage to say yes when sometimes you're scared can really help you go a long way. Everyone's got a vision, and they think it needs to happen in a certain way. I guess like you, your vision was to be a pro football player right um there was probably a bigger vision right. for you which um mm -hmm. I, I suppose if you were, if you're closed off and, and felt that you know you're you failed because you're not going to be a pro football player you'd, you'd have closed yourself off to a bigger opportunity um right. in terms of lessons do you, do you think it's it's you know not being affected by short-term failure and having a, a belief or a faith that there's something beyond that do you think yeah it's interesting because right now my vision is a lot more clear about where my life is going than back then. Right. Back then, I really didn't know. Right. Like, I didn't have a vision I was going to have a successful training business. That wasn't my vision. My right. vision was I was going to help people. Right. I okay. didn't know how that was going to be. I didn't know if I was going to be a chiropractor, a physical therapist, go to med school. I was going to be a football coach because I love football so much. But I knew I loved helping people. I knew I loved working with my hands. Um, and I wanted to be able to use my brain as well. But I kept saying yes to opportunities that would come my way. I had the opportunity um, when I was playing football to just take a, a good job as a high school teacher and football coach back in the day. And I said no to that. And I'm not sure why I said no to it because it was a good job and I didn't have any other jobs available at the time. But there was something that was holding me back from saying uh, yes because it seemed like the right thing. Right. Right. It's the same reason why I left L.A. People on the outside would be like, why are you leaving L.A.? It was because I knew I wanted to go back to grad school so that I would have a future hopefully someday as an entrepreneur, not knowing that I was going to meet my wife in grad school and that we were going to be settled here in San Diego, California on that stuff. I think it's sometimes you don't always have the answers when you're saying yes to the things. You can't always explain them. But one thing I could... Uh, certainly say is that when you make a decision you have to be all in on that decision and you have to connect with people you have to really connect with people deeply because um, especially today the world is so small and you're only a couple steps away from knowing anyone that you want to know and uh, especially in the fitness space man it's a it's a small industry in the sense of uh, just collaboration is you never know um, how someone can help you get you to where you want to go right. and I think that's important is I often talk about your network is your net worth your network is your net worth is you got to learn just to serve people and and on, on all levels of how can you be a better servant leader I'm always studying that how can I be a better servant leader what can I do to help my team at Fitness Quest 10 what can I help uh, my members and clients at Fitness Quest 10 be better people. How can I serve those that people I'm, that are on my my email list that I'm uh, or my mastermind group? Like, how can I serve them better? Like, what can I say to them or do for them that's going to help them be better? I just think the more you serve, um, then it's just fulfilling your your purpose of of impact. Yeah, people. great, great purpose. So, how did you go from then? You you got your PhD. You, in Malibu, how did you go then to open where we are right. here? Just to be clear, I didn't get my PhD. I oh, felt like I got my oh, PhD. Okay. I left to get my master's degree, right. but I felt like I got a PhD experience okay. up there right. uh, on that. Same thing. Um, when I finished graduate school at San Diego State University, got my master's degree, I got a, a right out of grad school, I got an opportunity to be a full time strength and conditioning coach at a great college in Los Angeles. It was a tenure track position. And I said no to it. And I had no other job. And I don't know why I did that, but it's interesting because if I would have said yes to that, I would have never opened my, my, my business here at Fitness Quest 10. I like San Diego. I was dating my future wife at the time, and I just didn't want to go back to L.A. to be a, a strength coach at that time. It just didn't feel right in my gut. I did a lot of soul searching. And anytime you're making big decisions, it takes soul searching. And, and so just, just on that, how – what – process do you go through to to make a big decision because it's, it's something we talk about quite a lot in our business we have these big decisions these big crossroads moment do you have a a process of what you go through to come to that point of saying right that's what i'm going to do oh 
It's pretty basic, honestly. It goes back even when I was in high school and college and massage therapy school. I remember doing this: the pluses and minus column. <laughs> yeah. Like the line up all the pluses, <laughs> line up all the minuses, and that's not the right answer. Like, oh, there's more pluses and minuses, so I got to do this one. But to me, I always start with the plus and minus column, and then for me, I typically go away and get quiet time. At that point in my life, I remember I was going down to the beach every morning and literally just like praying about it, right? And praying, where am I supposed to be? You know, for my divine purpose, where am I supposed to be? And give me the courage and the audacity to have the strength to say yes to what I'm supposed to be, not what the outside world thinks I'm supposed to do. Right. And that's hard yeah. because, like, if other people think, oh, my gosh, you got this great job, but you have this opportunity, how can you say no to that? Deep down, if, if there's a little voice in there, I call it the spirit, is saying, no, this is what I want you to do, then can you be discipline enough to to listen to that that's right. the hard part and for me that's why i said no at that time to an amazing opportunity there was no other tenure track strength and conditioning coaches at the university level um at that time but obviously when i was able to tap into that i think god had a different plan for me three months later i found this space and again despite having no clients no money or no business plan I opened upon faith, faith that it, it was going to work out somehow because I was, was just going to be me and I was going to share my passion. I was going to start small. I was going to uh, just base it on that. And fortunately, uh, it's all worked out quite good. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I hit here and speak to people about that meditation time or that time in the morning where they just disconnect from everything and, and get at one with themselves do, do, do you think that's and I know you you, you mentioned the word you know you pray and, and, and listen to yourself but do, do you think that's something in terms of a of something you can take away from what you learned from there that 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 you know mm -hmm. that's what's going on yeah <laughs> I, I just I can't imagine my life without me doing that right because that is my life yeah um, early mornings late at nights just journaling praying meditating and getting the quiet time it's a very noisy world with yeah. phones, constantly text, social media, and everything else, all the things I love to do, you got to turn off your phone sometimes. One of the biggest blessings you can do is turn off your phone and just listen. Literally just listen to your inside. Uh, call what you want. You can call it prayer. You can call it meditation. You can journal because, again, I love journaling because you get clarity when you put things on paper. But for me, not just when things are, like, down or bad and I need a decision, but even just, like, in busy times, if it's busy um, I think in today's day with such high stress and anxiety and depression, I think to be able to just quiet the mind for a few minutes early in the morning before the, bi before the day gets away from you is absolutely imperative. Right. Like it's, it's, even if it's three minutes yeah. of that is huge. Sometimes in the middle of a day, I'll literally just shut my door, I'll turn my phone off, I will not go on email, and I'll just close my eyes, and I'm not taking a nap, although that sometimes sounds good, I'm just trying to tap into my breath so I can relax because, I mean, in today's day, there's a lot of moving parts and it's, it's happening faster and faster and faster and it can consume you. I just find you get such, clar such more clarity when you can quiet things down. I often tell my athletes something, is good players can speed a game up, great players can slow a game down. Right. So how do you slow the game down? Yeah. How do you slow everything around you down? And if you can't slow down, then you can't be great. No. So it's easy just to be in the rat race all the time. People are like, Todd, how do you get the energy you have? What a lot of people don't know is it's the yin side. I call it the yin, the quiet side that fuels the fire. Yeah. So it's getting the quiet time, the meditation time, the prayer time. It's the getting more mellow yellow time away in the quiet, whether it be going to the beach or for me, I love the mountains. Uh, now and getting away and fueling the spirit so the f the spirit comes alive and go on fire yeah. so that when I'm training my athletes or I'm doing a meeting for the team or I'm at a conference or an event um, if I'm on a podcast or I'm doing a, a YouTube or video that I could just be me and feel like I can let my passion flow yeah so I think that's part of the the um, you know the the secret sauce is is quieting everything down going inside tapping into that spirit and, and making sure that I'm abiding by uh, my divine purpose. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's an interesting point and thinking through what you're saying, I, I guess the body and business are quite simple. I, I think in business, people feel that they've got to work hard, 
you know, 16 hours a day to, to, to be successful, which you have got to work hard. And, I, I, and same for an athlete. If you want to if, if, if you want to be strong or fast or whatever, you, you train a lot. Or, and, right. and, and I think both in business and in, 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 in your physical body, you can have that overtraining. Or, or it, in, in, and I, I think in business, particularly as people get tired, they don't get the rest. And I think if you don't have that time, and I know in my experience is, you know, when, you're not, when you need a break, you can be making those decisions too quickly. Right. Wrong decisions, maybe wrong relationships, wrong partnerships that set you up on a course that before you know it, you're, you know, you're going to break down right. either physically or, or within your business. So I think, I think it's a really interesting takeaway is, is getting that balance both in your body, which I know is a big part of what you talk about, the, the recovery, the, the massage, etc. And, and same Huge. for your business is, is, to, yeah. is to make sure you've got some time to well, do it. I was asked a question once by um, one of my, my my main business mentors, his name is Wayne Cotton, who helped me start Fitness Quest 10. He's still a huge part of my life today. He's not in the fitness business. He was a client. He was a client, and uh, he's a Canadian man who's just become very, very close. And he asked me a question many, many moons ago. He said, Todd, is life a marathon or a sprint? And I'd ask you the same question to think, what is it? Is it a marathon or a sprint? I said, it's a marathon. He who gets to the finish line first wins. To this day, I can hear his voice saying, Todd, if you keep running a marathon at a sprinter's pace, you're going to die just like your father. And I was like, wow. What he was saying is, life is not a marathon. Life is a series of sprints. Sprint, rest, sprint, rest. Right. When I was writing my first book, it was a 10-week sprint. And then I had to get rest after it. There are some days that are 16-hour days, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. As long as you have the counterbalance on the other side, whether the next day or the next week, is you're having the downtime as well. Right. The problem comes in is when we're working 16-hour days, day after day after day, and you face plan into the couch, you're absolutely dilapidated of energy, you're burnt out, you lose the passion for this industry, and all of a sudden you're like, I don't like this. Yeah. It's because your energies are burnt. There are times if you have like a project that you're really hot on and you got a writing project, you got something that you're trying to create, you're going to have to sprint. And it's not always just for a day or for a week. Sometimes it's a series of weeks. But you have to build in sprint, rest, sprint, rest. It's just like that you or I would train an, a high-level athlete. You got to you got to sprint them and you got to recover them twice as hard. Yeah. So you got to make sure they get the high intensity interval training in and then they need body work. They need soft tissue work. They need to get into the infrared sauna. They need to get some acupuncture. All of these things, it's no different. It's the mindset of there are days I got to suck it up and I'm going to have a 16 hour day and I'm going to be so focused on this project and that's okay. But I'm going to tell them to communicate to my, my wife and kids, hey, listen, I might not be the best dad for the next week, but here, when dad does this, here's the end result of what it's going to do for the universe. And I promise you when I'm done with this project, here's what we're going to do. Yeah. It's a carrot at the end for me and for them. I think it's a part of, of just success and achievement is there's times when you got to sprint but you got to make sure that you rest as well. You yeah. just can't sprint at a marathon you know, at a, uh, and do a marathon all the time. In your business, to talk about what, what you have now, and it, you know, we, we, we categorize it as fitness, fitness training, and, and I guess everybody has a perception about it. But listening to, to you and reading, um, you know, reading parts of your books and, and your blogs, it, it, it comes across, if you listen to your materials, that that's a, a, a quite a small part of what you talk about. Um, you know, how, how would you explain that? It, it, you know, the, from, from, although it's, there's, there's fitness equipment and the people are moving out, what's, what's the difference between the sort of mind and the, then the heart side compared to the actual bit when you're, you're lifting stuff and you're running? How would you describe that? I, I do think it's all related. I'm a huge believer and it goes way beyond sets and reps. It goes way beyond squats, bench press, push-ups and, and pull-ups. I think I think that physical conditioning drives success. I'm a huge believer that if you are training hard and you're eating right, you will live inspired. I believe that you have to nurture the head, the heart, and the hunger, okay? right. the, the horror, the, the inside, the gut. And when those three H's are, are really uh, being nurtured at a high level, then I think that you, know, you could succeed. So although people may come into Fitness Quest 10 and say, I want to lose 15 or 20 pounds of, you know, of fat or weight, um, can you help me do that? Of course we can. But 
To me, there's typically another reason why someone wants to come in. Maybe they don't feel the way they should. Maybe their knees hurt, their back hurts. Possibly their mind's not right and they're struggling with some depression or they're highly stressed and the weight is, a, is an end product. For me, what I would say is we change lives. We change lives. That's our, our slogan here at Fitness Quest 10 is we change lives and we're the best part of your day every day. And for me, uh, that's what 38 of us do is we change lives. How do you do that? Sometimes it's going inside someone's head and making sure their mind is right. Sometimes it's making sure they get the most crushing uh, workout ever. Sometimes it's more of a yin workout. We got a yin work and we've got to focus on more of the meditation, flexibility, uh, yoga, body work type of stuff. So it's part scientist, it's part artist. Right. I believe the best coaches are part, part scientist, part artist. You could be the smartest guy in the world. And I used to hire people based on their credentials. And that was a major mistake because if they can't relate to a human being, they're not going to be a great trainer. Right. I've also met a lot of people that are great with people, but they don't study the science. They don't study all of that. You have to learn about the intricacies of the most amazing machine ever created, the human body. If you can create the art and the science and put that into one and realize it's your art, it's your creation, every time we work with a person or a small group or a large group and we can create magic in that, Man, you're making the world a better place, and that's what we do in the fitness industry. And to me, that's what we do and why we do it. So, uh, so to be successful in this is you, you know, yes. it, you've got to study, you've got to get both of those 100%, together. Hundred percent, right? Hundred percent. And you know, as far as like, I always say, hey, I could train someone in a parking lot and get them great. When we have these tools all around us, I think tools just help us, right? We always uh, want to, people, people in today's day have ADD. They, 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 they want to be challenged in different ways. And I think a lot of times, you know, I know my pro athletes are often like, they don't want to do the same thing every day. Of course not, neither do I. So there's a lot of ways to skin a cat. And I think uh, when it comes to the science and the art, you want to be able to challenge movement and look at the way the body moves and how can I get this person better? Whether it be a house mom, an executive, a pro athlete, a young kid uh, with self-esteem and confidence issues, how can I help that young man or, or boy or girl uh, be better? How can I help that woman achieve uh, the dress size that she wants to get back into? How can I help that senior who's 87 years old, who still comes in and does boxing and pushes prowlers? How can I help the pastor who comes here because when he's at the pulpit, he wants to come across with strong, vibrant energy? To me, that's what fires me up. So I will finish off. We've got a, I've got a couple of questions. We'll uh, sort of, I, I call them quick fire, but... Um, <laughs> We're going deep in some cases. The first one I want to ask is one of your questions, and I, I heard you, you say this, and it, and it got me thinking, and it's one that I've, I'm, I'm now working on what the answer is. But if you were told you've got a year left to live, mm. what would be the most important thing that you would do in that year? Or what would be, yeah, what would be the biggest thing that you would do in that year? I'd make sure that I got to see every one of my family members, uh, not only my immediate family, my wife and three kids, and spend a lot of time with them but I've got as I said seven brothers and sisters and a mother and I would spend a lot of time with them uh, I'd make sure all my deck everything is in line with my business that I could pass on the legacy that it would live forever um, and it's not just Todd's gone so Fitness Quest 10 is gone I want that legacy uh, to live on but it, it ultimately comes down to uh, checking off more bucket list trips vacations and times things it's about the experiences in life um, so that's what I'd say. Travel more, spend time with, with uh, family and friends, and spend time uh, making sure that my, my, uh, my faith is right so that I can uh, go to eternal peace. Yeah. And it sounds like in some ways you're kind of, that's your life now as well. You know, you kind of, I, 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 would, would you say you're sort of living it as though it, it is your, yes, it would be. Right. I often ask, and, and, and more <laughs> recently for whatever reason, I would say, what if today was my last day? How am I going to live it? And not that I'm always, I'm not, I'm not, I don't take as many vacations as I want to, but I, I realize the quality of the relationships is ultimately what it's about. And um, sometimes we hold grudges or we hold arguments or things like that too long instead of just forgiving, moving on and, and, uh, and that. So, uh, yeah, I try to really make sure that my life is, is constantly congruent with, with my belief system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, what, what's your, so you've touched on it a little bit, but what's, what does the first hour of your day look like? In some way, I'm nurturing my physical or spiritual health. 
Typically, it's coming down and um, taking about 10 minutes of quiet time and journaling time. I'll pray, I'll open up the Word, get into the Word, and uh, I'll journal. And some of that time, again, is, is spent in pure just listening, because I've learned a big part of prayer is listening, not just asking God for, for direction or, or strength, but actually just listening. So the first 10 minutes is that, and usually the rest of that is some way of 45 to 60 minutes of working out in my gym between 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning um, so that I can get in my fasted cardio. I'll typically get in some weights as well. And uh, to me, when I'm doing that, listening to my podcast, man, there's nothing better. 6 <laughs> o'clock, I'm done, and I feel like a million bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Spiritually, physically, <clears throat> mentally, I'm ready to conquer the day. Yeah, okay. Um, what one word would you use to describe your own business style, so how you are as a, a leader within your, your, your business? Impact. Impact. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Big I mean, thing on your T-shirt. Impact. <laughs> and that stands for live inspired, master your craft, play at world class, um, take action, condition for greatness, and be tenacious. Um, so to me, when you look at the levels of leadership, five, level five being an emotional leader, I'm definitely an emotional leader. I, 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 I get emotional pretty quick. Even sometimes in this interview earlier on, I get emotional. Um, I just sometimes feel the value of time, man. We, we, we are on borrowed time yeah. here, and uh, how do you tap into every bit of potential we have? So to me, at the end of the day, I want to be known as an impact leader. It's going to be on my tombstone statement, impact man, father, husband, leader, coach, um, and dad, and uh, inspired millions of greatness. Yeah, very inspiring. <laughs> Um, what's your favorite bang for buck exercise? Bench press. <laughs> Bench press. <yeah. laughs> what a meathead answer. I'm such a meathead. But if I only had one exercise to do, I mean, most of like squats and I love squats. I love deadlifts. But man, there's nothing like just getting under the bar and doing some bench press. I, and I love and I love push ups and I love pull ups. But if you said if, if you only had one, I want a barbell and I want a bench. Yeah. <laughs> Old school. What was your last workout? What was my last workout? Yeah. Oh, my last workout, I actually just Instagrammed. It was pretty crazy. I had a gray hoodie on because my best workouts come with gray hoodies on. And I did a five by five system. And I did, I did a bench press. Imagine that. I did bench press. I have a swinging bar. I did a swinging bar pull-ups on that, which is hard. I did yeah. squats and deadlifts. So I did squats, deads, push and pull. And then at the end, I had chains and I did bicep curls. So I did chain curls, max reps with chain kickbacks. You can go on my Instagram and see it. I literally just did it yesterday. And um, it was crazy. It was fun. It was epic. I started these things like on Thursday, media day. So I said, okay, let's go five by five system, which is always a great system. I got squats, deads, bench, poles, and finish, of course, with some arms. So great question. That sounds pretty crazy. <laughs> it was great uh, okay what's the best piece of advice you've ever received wow best piece of advice I've ever received um, if it comes just from personally it's uh, make sure your your walk with God is right right and what, what would you expand on that a little bit just because like if your faith isn't there you get lost and you realize the decisions you make are based on your ego and what's in your head versus what God's, God's purpose is for you. And that's really hard. I, I'm always working on my own faith and certainly not perfect by any means. But like the more time I spend in trying to uh, strengthen my faith and my walk and, and, and being a man of God is making sure that that's right because nothing else matters. At the end of the day, when we die, we're all going to die. If that's not right, nothing else matters. So to me, it's the best piece of advice would be make sure your, your walk with God is, is in, in alignment. Right, yeah. Okay. And I've got one more question, but before I ask that, just, just tell us a little bit about, you've got a, you've got a, um, a mentor program. Um, tell, tell us a bit about the, the, the programs and, and uh, things that you're, you're able, if you know, people want to, get involved with you and learn more about you know what the, op the opportunities that you can offer sort of younger aspiring business people um, what, what 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 do they have available to them yeah a few different things and, and thanks for asking that um, 
two different ways. Number one, I have a, a three and a half day live mentorship program. Uh, over the years, I would, was getting a lot of the same questions from young trainers or even seasoned vet trainers that are looking to grow in their leadership or their marketing or their business or their personal development. And um, we have live mentorship programs. I only do one a year uh, that's live. It's very intensive. It takes about six months of planning for myself and my team because it's deep. It's uh, kind of like a Tony Robbins kind of event for a fitness professional that's geared to what you can do to maximize your potential. And I always say you can only go as far as you grow and all this, the different experiences we have in life um, uh, contribute to what your ultimate purpose is gonna be. The three and a half day live mentorship program is for me to coach you uh, to get everything out of you that you're meant to be and that you're designed to be uh, and to, to leave no stone unturned about what your purpose is in any area of your life. Because if your personal life isn't right, then you can't, you can't be the best professional and you can't run the best business that you have. So I really go deep into that aspect in the live mentorship. And the other coaching program I offer is my mastermind coaching program. I'm in my 10th year of the mastermind coaching program. It's virtual, 90% uh, of it's virtual. We have two live retreats a year, one here in San Diego and one in the mountains. Because so I love thinking big in the mountains. And um, uh, that's one where we connect with monthly calls and, and different webinars and programs. Uh, and that's, I take great pride in that because um, we've got a couple hundred fire breathing fit pros in there that really are creating impact worldwide. They're from all over the place. Um, and we go every month into business, marketing, leadership, in the trenches, acumen, all the training aspect, and then um, also, of course, personal development. Right. And uh, that's something that I'm continually uh, working on and trying to create great value for fit pros on what they can do. It's very heart-centered. Uh, there's a lot of strategies and systems that I employ in there uh, to make sure that someone can really take their business and their life to the next level. Right, okay. And where, where do you where you find out about your, your website or anything? Best thing is just toddurkin.com on right. that. So uh, the gym here is fitnessquest10.com, fitnessquest10.com. But all of those coaching programs and events um, are at toddurkin.com. Okay, great. And then final question. Um, so Escape Your Limits and the philosophy of the podcast is about people who overcome what they've been told to believe is impossible and making it possible. Mm. What would be your most memorable example of escaping your own personal limits? <laughs> <laughs> you talked about it earlier, but I'd say escape, escaping your own limits was, was on the show NBC Strong. Right. Um, because... The reason why I say that is because I went in as the oldest trainer and the role I thought I was going to have wasn't the role I had. I didn't know I was competing on the show. I thought I was a trainer to one of the trainees. And when they had this massive twist that the trainer was going to compete with the trainee, I was like, oh, shoot, <laughs> I can't train like that anymore. I got a bad knee. My back's always hurting. And I was thinking, I started building my own excuses. The same excuse I heard from my clients I started having the same thoughts. And what happened on that, uh, make a long story short, was uh, I got eliminated after week three. Uh, my partner and I failed in a, in a challenge. We got beaten in this challenge. I got sent home. I was back here at Fitness Quest 10. I was back here for a few days and I was beat up. I mean, I was hobbling. I couldn't walk, but I was kind of glad to be home because my son was playing football and I could see the football season. I'm on the sideline of the football game and all of a sudden I get a phone call from the producer, Dave Broom uh, and Sylvester Stallone saying, hey, we need you back up to Hollywood. There's a twist going on. I'm like, what's the twist? They're like, well, you're going to have to compete to get back in the game. I said, no, 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 I can't compete. I tore my labor in my shoulder. My knee is giving me a lot of problems. I can't compete. They're like, well, listen, come back up, and uh, we'll get you back on the show. If nothing else, you get some more air time. I'm like, all right. And I kind of <laughs> be begrudgingly went up. And uh, when I was leaving that, that day to go back up to Strong, I'm at the breakfast table and I was with my wife and three kids and, and I was only gonna be gone for a few days because I was gonna be back home because I was gonna lose this competition. I said, who thinks dad's gonna win and stay on the show? And my wife's like, not a chance. And two of, the th two of my three kids were like, dad, we'll see you in probably about two days. And my one son's like, dad, I believe in you, you're gonna go all the way. <laughs> and I said, thanks Brady. 
Well, sure enough, I went back up on the show, and uh, we had a chance to get back in the game, and it was just me competing personally. I no longer had a, a teammate. And there were three, uh, three other men that were el eliminated from the game, and these dudes were studs. I mean, they were younger than me. They were stronger than me. They were bigger than me. Um, and it was like I wasn't getting back in the game until all of a sudden that morning when I'm walking around uh, the, 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 the outside gym there, I heard the trainers and contestants that were still in the game on the show, I heard them talking about who they thought was going to back in, get back in the game. And I not once heard my name. <laughs> and they were hedging their bets. And it was kind of making me mad. And all of a sudden... This competitive spirit overtook me, the same competitive spirit when I was a 23, 24, 25-year-old football player competing to get back in the game. All of a sudden, I said, they have no idea what's inside of me. They don't know what's inside of me. And although these other guys are bigger and stronger, they're not going to compete with what I have, and I'm going to lay it all on the line. I have <laughs> no idea, but maybe God has a plan. And sure enough, somehow miraculously, um, that's when the story of Chris Ryan reminding me who I was because I saw one of the guys fly through this four-story um, tower. They call the Elimination Tower, go through there in about three and a half minutes. And I was like, how am I going to do that? It was my turn. <laughs> I don't know what was in me that night, but it wasn't me going through that tower. All of a sudden, my father was with me. Some of my best friends that had passed away tragically were with me, and I was flying through there like I was 25 years old again. <laughs> and before I knew it, I shocked the world. I shocked more than anything myself that I got back in the game. I proved to myself that day that all of us have head trash. All of us have things in our minds that hold us back, and you got to escape that limit. That was a limiting thought. That was a limiting belief that was holding me back. Until I put my neck on the line and did my best, perhaps that day I wouldn't have won. And it wasn't about the winning. It was about going out and competing. And lo and behold, I got back in the game. And that was week five. And then I won in week six. And I won in week seven. And I won in week eight. And we won in week nine. And next thing I know, I'm in the finals. <laughs> I'm in the finals thinking, my kids don't even know I'm still competing <laughs> because you, you're disconnected with real reality. Yeah. And here I am. And um, despite not winning the overall event, the most important thing of, of that entire experience was proving to me and to all of us that we're always stronger than we think. Right. We're yeah. always, we always have more up top than we think. And when you're tired and you're fatigued, you got more in you. So never give up. Never stop trying and always put yourself on the cusp of greatness. And to me, that's escaping your limits. Yeah. Todd, you're an inspiration. I've gone away inspired. Thank, thank you very much for your time. It's much appreciated. Thanks, Matthew. I appreciate thank you. it, man. Thank you. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.